right, good afternoon again. I'm just going to start, uh, maybe just a quick introduction. So we have this panel titled Programmable Money in Singapore. Uh, but what we are going to be speaking about in the next 30 minutes or so, it's really about Project Orchid, kind of the motivation behind it, what we have achieved, and uh, just go through some of the case studies where PBM or purpose-bound money can be utilized. And with me to really share this uh, experience of purpose-bound money, share the thinking behind it, motivation behind it. We have a wonderful panel um, next to me. So I'm going to start things off very quickly, perhaps starting with actually uh, the motivation, the motivation behind purpose-bound money, the, pur the motivation behind programmable money in Singapore. And I'm going to start off with actually Peng Kim to give us his perspective in terms of purpose-bound money, how different it is from the existing payment landscape infrastructure that we have in Singapore. So over to you, Peng Kim. Uh, good afternoon. Um, just a quick uh, uh, introduction on the payment landscape in Singapore, right? Uh, if you recall, 2014, we started the FAST. 2017, we introduced a pay now, which make it easier to actually uh, you know, uh, use a proxy on a mobile phone or ID to actually make the payment. Uh, last year, we actually introduced eGyro to make it easier for uh, individuals or companies to actually apply for uh, you know, uh, direct debit uh, with, with the billers. Right? Um, so, all these put together, including the MAPS Plus upgrade that happened this year, is actually making the Singapore uh, payments landscape very comprehensive and very efficient, right, to make payments for wholesale, for retail. But there's still a challenge, a challenge on the last mile where resulting in that we still can't get rid of uh, cashier orders, we can't get rid of checks. It's because certain payments, certain settlement has to take place when certain condition happens. So the project Orchid allows us to study, to experiment, how do we take cash, <coughs> wrap it with smart contract, and use a smart contract to actually program or lay the conditions of who can use it, when you can use it, and for what transactions, and, and where and why, right? Kind of thing. And this, this is uh, pretty interesting and uh, a lot of pop uh, potential use cases. Yeah. All right, if I can turn over to maybe Talita, then I think uh, when we started this project, Project Orchid, um, and we spoke about purpose-bound money, one of the things that captured people's imagination in one, the conversations that I have is that in Singapore, we have the Redeem SG platform. It's known for issuing out, I guess, the CDC, or the platform for issuing out the CDC voucher. So maybe if I could turn over to Talita to maybe speak briefly about uh, the open government products and also Redeem and how different is um, Project Orchid and its aims uh, uh, from what is already existing. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Talitha and, and I represent the Redeem, Redeem SG team. Um, so we built a voucher system and through working with various government agencies on voucher programs, we identified three key problems that need to be solved. So the first one is the high cost of implementing government voucher campaigns. So for example, every time you, let's say MOE wants to give vouchers to needy students only to buy books, you need to think about where or when or how these vouchers go, are going to be used. And Typically, you would even need to commission a system costing thousands or millions of dollars for that voucher campaign. Um, the second one is the high cost of settlement. So typically, whenever a voucher is being redeemed, you actually log a transaction and then we would separately need to pay out to the merchants. And, and that's, that's a financial reconciliation burden. And the third one um, is the high cost of contracting between government agencies and merchants. And so with these three problems, this idea behind purpose-bound money is really to have a common protocol across vouchers and money, right? One protocol. Um, and the idea is almost like a present. You basically have money that's wrapped with where, how, when it's being used. And when you use it at the merchant, it just unwraps. And the beauty of it is whether you're using Redeem SG or you're using Grab or you're using uh, another wallet like MetaMask, you can actually just access your tokens and spend it as you wish at the merchants. So the, so the idea behind it is this vision of a common platform or protocol across vouchers and money. And, and we think that with that, you know, you solve the settlement problem with the money directly in the merchant. You also solve the contracting problem with targeting merchants. And you also solve the problem of needing to rebuild the voucher system. So turning over to Melvin. So OCBC has launched, I guess, GovCash as a government payout uh, service in 2021, I guess in collaboration with the CPF board. 
maybe you could tell us, uh, you know, in your words, how different is this of the concept of PVM, this programmable money, digital SGD, how does it fit into the whole ecosystem? Yeah, so thanks. Thanks, Alan. And uh, so we were working on a problem statement together with CPF. Hi. How to get cash into yeah. the hands of the unbanked in Singapore? So surprisingly, there are still 30,000, 40,000 individuals in Singapore who do not own a bank account or have access to a bank account. The problem statement required us to go one level further, that these individuals also do not have access, digital access to the bank account, so no mobile phone. So this was a really daunting problem, and the solution was GovCash. We used OCBC ATMs using uh, GovTech's NDI facial recognition, the same facial recognition that you would use when you go and travel and come back into Singapore, to be able to identify the individual. They scan their barcode on their IC and they receive their cash. No need for bank account, no need for, for mobile phone. So GovCash solved the problem statement very uh, succinctly and we were able to launch that about a year ago. However, uh, GovCash can be a lot more and when we look at uh, the, the, the issues that we were trying to solve with GovCash, there are a few things that we wanted, we, we wanted to bridge the gap. The first point was that it is still a payment. GovCash is still a payment. And because it is a payment, you either make the payment in full or you don't make the payment at all. Secondly, the fulfillment of the cash going out is dependent on the channel in which it is being used. In this case, the ATM machine. ATM machines cannot disperse uh, amounts below $10 or in fractional currency, in fractional coins. ATMs also have a limit on how much money can be taken out. The third issue is that uh, this payment cannot be assigned to someone else, on, onward endorsed to someone else. So enter the concept of central bank backed digital currency wrapped in purpose bound money. The ability for us to use CBDC wrapped in purpose bound money solves these three problems in a way that couldn't have been solved before. Firstly, CBDCs and the purpose bound money is a store of value. A store of value that doesn't need to be taken at one go, but it could be done in terms of partial payments. Secondly, it solves the problem of uh, the different channels that we use to disperse the monies. You can disperse it over periods of time through different channels so that at the end of the day, the individual can get his money in, in much more uh, fractional uh, amounts than what he used to do. And lastly, this this kind of purpose-bound money can be programmed to be assigned or endorsed to somebody else. So that if the individual cannot come personally to get the money, they could appoint a family member or somebody else to come and take it on behalf. With purpose-bound money wrapping around central bank supported digital currencies, we can change the landscape of how we do government disbursements in Singapore. So turning over to you, Wenping, maybe from a merchant perspective, what does this mean? Yes. So really excited to be here. Um, we, we've always believed that Web3 has uh, transformational and disruptive uh, uh, benefits to uh, real world uh, challenges. And being able to be part of this project allows us to uh, think of ways in which merchants can benefit from such technology applications. Um, case in point are the small medium enterprises, the micro merchants that are on Grab's network we, we find that they have very high intent to participate in programs and disbursements of vouchers or, or e-money, but they lack the technical know-how and also they lack the, the, the capital resources to invest in systems, to train their staff to be able to participate. So technology and applications such as PBM allow such merchants to adopt technology and participate in, in this um, uh, set of uh, benefits very easily without having to invest in new systems, without having to invest in staff training. One case in point that I can remember quite clearly was in 2020 um, when we, it was the height of the COVID pandemic and Grab was helping to disburse uh, CDC vouchers to 12,000 needy families and, and, and children. Uh, even as Grab being a technology company, we found that we also had to tweak our systems in order to 
manage the conditions of the disbursements such that it's only to be used for food and uh, grocery purchases. So imagine that uh, these, these problems can be, could be exacerbated when, when we are thinking about the, the long tail of merchants and sellers. Okay, so PBMs, uh, I think the use case that has been spoken about a lot is about vouchers, commercial vouchers, government vouchers. So I, th I, think, uh, uh, I think what we have uncovered at least during the past few months that we've been working on it, is it goes beyond that. I think it goes beyond that, the use case for purpose-bound money. I'm going to turn over to Adrian actually going to be speaking about it, but more from a corporate and from an SME perspective, your thoughts on this space. Okay, so PBM, uh, particularly in the form of digital currencies, we, we see actually quite good use case and a lot of potential, particularly in two key areas. One, precisely what, what, what purpose one money is, is there's a predetermined purpose for the monies to be spent. So safeguards and controls can be then put seamlessly in place so that, 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 that um, it improves the control process. The, today, I think it has a lot of applicability to government payouts, government payments, uh, as well as to corporates as well as to make certain payments for particular purposes. So the, the case that actually that, that we are together with actually OGP, we are working with, with Skills Future. And you know Skills Future, the government actually gives Singaporeans grants or, or Skills Future credits so that they can use that to pay for eligible training courses uh, that, that meet certain conditions. So those conditions can be then put into the purpose bound money such that uh, and we, we, we are working with them to, to, to test certain use case, how you can improve the control process, the safeguarding process, so that it is not misused. And the purpose is then, as the participating training providers then meets those conditions, the money is then automatically unwrapped and paid to them. So that purpose-bound money is this one. The other one is, it's, is in the form of promoting uh, in fair trading. So today, the, and this particularly has, has a lot of applications to small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, because SMEs today, they are lesser known, they are smaller, and their customers as well as the, their, their, their suppliers may not know them as well. There's always a lack of trust. We can actually use or conditions that are programmed into digital currency so that we make the transaction more fair for the buyer and the seller. Let me give you a case in point. Today, purchasing over e-commerce is, is, is getting more and more popular. But when, when, when a consumer, and typically the, the buyers are consumers, when you make a purchase from a merchant, the merchants, because of the lack of trust, we, they don't know who the consumers are. They will ask them to prepay before I deliver my goods. The, but the consumers will be concerned, hey, if I prepay, what if I don't receive the goods, or if I receive the goods that are not in proper order as what you have put in into the online? So, one of these use cases is that we can actually program the digital currency so that the PBM can be paid upfront to the merchant, but it has conditions. For example, where the delivery is made in proper order. So, there is actually a lot of use cases and particularly in overcoming the, the whole issue of lack of trust, consumer protection, as well as, as promoting fair trading, so that the, actually SMEs are a very big beneficiary of, 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 of this exercise. So Project Orchid has, uh, I guess its primary goal is really looking at, I guess, few, few things. One is the utility of uh, digital currency in Singapore, digital SGD in Singapore, interoperability with existing rails, and uh, you know, really about building infrastructure to support uh, you know, any future decision for MES to issue out a digital Singapore dollar. I think what is perhaps not obvious uh, uh, and, and I wanted to highlight here as well, the digital currency um, that we have kind of uh, uh, spoken about here under Project Orchid and some of the trials uh, the rest of the panelists is going to speak about uh, will actually feature a number of different types of digital currencies, both tokenized bank liabilities in form of deposits or stable coins, etc. So I'm going to turn over to Peng Kim actually just to get his perspective. What does all this mean uh, to, uh, from a financial institution perspective? How does it change how banks uh, respond or even how they operate? Oh, 
Okay. Um, as I, I talked about it earlier, right? Uh, already in the the payment rails in Singapore is very very efficient. Uh, but from a bank angle, we look at it as you know how can we uh, you know uh, leverage on this to bring about uh, greater efficiency uh, in the back office, right? For the bank in terms of managing risk better in a, in a settlement, uh, you know, uh, in handling settlement better and also the, the reconciliation. So, for example, although it's not on this uh, programmable money or uh, PPM thing, uh, we pilot with uh, cross-border and uh, cross-currency payment settlement in Patio uh, last year, all right, uh, under the same concept. And when we piloted it, we noticed that actually the back office uh, post transaction settlement reconciliation is actually autom fully automated that we can actually eliminate the need for post uh, you know investigation and so on right it, it takes away that and uh, we are very excited that you know the purpose of looking into you know this area is how we can actually be more efficient and we can help our customers be more efficient I think we look at uh, you know like what Adrian say a lot of use cases between P to G payment G to P payment P to B and so on, right? And that, that's huge advantage. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to home in on the trials that we mentioned. I guess in the media release, we announced four trials. I'm going to invite actually uh, the panelists here to kind of unpack. I think some of you have actually tried that out already at the Orchid booth and some of the other participating uh, merchants. So maybe turn over to um, Talita first, maybe just to talk about the trial that uh, OGP is uh, running with, together with DBS. Yeah, sure. So we are working with DBS on this trial and um, we started it off with three key objectives. So the first one is just how can merchants be paid faster? I mean, in our course of work, we talk to merchants from the range of your hawkers to NTUC to Sheng Xiong and we, we always hear the same thing, you know, they want to be paid faster. How, how can we shorten the time to pay them? The second one really is um, in terms of how can we use a smart contract for government programs? And, and this is completely new. Um, all the challenges I mentioned just now about where or how um, these vouchers are going to be used, all of that could be used, could be specified in a smart contract. And the third one is um, just thinking about how can it be interoperable across platforms. Yeah, so, so those, those were our three objectives. I think um, what we have done so far, and you can pop by our Project Orchid booth um, to claim a voucher as well, is um, simply like a staff voucher program. And at its core, is what I mentioned just now, which is that um, the digital SGD will be issued by the bank and then it's wrapped with a purpose and then the voucher is just spent as usual at the merchant. And when, once the voucher is spent at this merchant, actually back end what's happening is this, um, this PBM unwraps to become digital SGD and the merchant directly gets some money. So I think through the course of um, piloting this, actually what we found is those three objectives are indeed met. Um, we, we definitely could use a smart contract in future. We definitely could, it definitely could be interoperable. And, and yeah, merchants get paid faster. Um, that being said, I think there are a host of issues we are um, cognizant of and that we are working through. So I think the first one um, being the, the user experience. So I think um, as a government, you know, we need to be inclusive and make sure that whatever we build is accessible. It can't just be, you know, for digitally savvy or people with phones or even the best phones, it needs to work across platforms and we need to see how um, to make this experience seamless for everyone. Um, for example, how do people access their wallets? Um, those are questions. Maybe the second one is about going to Web3 and a permissionless model. So I think this is a huge learning experience for us. We find that uh, moving to Web3, uh, the issues perhaps around network reliability or variable costs or, for example, um, yeah, the transaction speed, uh, maybe not being as fast. And so those are things we are working through. It's not insurmountable, um, but we have to look at. Um, and perhaps, yeah, the, um, th those are the two key issues. And perhaps those, those issues are th teething things, but we will continue to work on it and refine it in the next year. Yeah, so I think one of the other areas that we're looking at, I guess, in the next phase is this topic about accessibility. How do we make it even more inclusive? for people to participate. I mean, for the purpose of this trial, I think uh, the team has uh, created something that's perhaps uh, uh, easier for, the, for this group to kind of experience, whether it's through the, the existing um, Redeem SG interface, which some of you are familiar with, 
and maybe a more uh, a Web3 type of wallet experience. So turning over to Wenbin to just speak about the commercial voucher, because you had a different user experience. For those who were at the booth, you probably have had a chance to look at both. And uh, I think the thought process there was also to look at what's the best user experience for different sets of users, but yet have some aspects around interoperability. So Wenbin, tell us about the commercial trial. Firstly, I really like to uh, thank uh, many of us in this room uh, for gamely taking part in a live production trial in the spirit of a FinTech Festival. We are all part of uh, an iterative product development process, so really thank everybody for, for those who have uh, redeemed your voucher, SFF voucher at the different merchant locations. I, I thank you for your support. Looking forward to hear your feedback. Now, onto the trial and what we are trying to achieve. The first issue or concept that we want to test is the concept of true interoperability. The idea that any consumer or any wallet user, to Talita's point on inclusion and preference on the choice of UX, we want to make sure that that UX layer can be built on top of existing Web3 infrastructure, which is why in the trial, uh, some of us would have experienced the, the, the UI, UI of a sequence a blockchain app and for that matter, you could build a UX onto any other blockchain application and you can still receive the voucher. What this means is that it allows for us in future to develop different UI experience that appeals to different consumer segment groups especially for those that are particularly uh, vulnerable or need special uh, accessibility needs. On the merchant front, we've also worked very hard to make sure that the barriers to adoption is as low as possible. So in this case, we, we work closely with StraightsX, our technology partner, to ensure that the P PBM, when unwrapped and accepted on the merchant uh, terminal, does not feel any different to the cashier staff. So to the merchant cashier staff, he or she will see a receipt of $5 or $6, any amount. There's no concept of PBM at all. And the technology does the conditional checks, the technology does the verification checks. So that's what we are trying to test today uh, in this, this four, days, uh, four day event. And, and we hope to hear more of your feedback. Looking forward, what this means is that it can unlock more use cases and more opportunities for us to serve different needs. So think of uh, conditions such as where we want to help protect minors from um, perhaps inadvertently buying uh, alcohol or, or cigarettes. Such conditions can be programmed into PBM to make sure that transactions such as, the, as these are prohibited. And that helps with a wider spread, widespread adoption of PBM. So maybe turning over to Melvin, I think uh, uh, if you could share with the audience here the, the trial that you're thinking of, with government payout. And I think there's a question from the audience as well about the question about identity. If you could help with that, how do you validate the identity of the person expected to, I guess, receive the PBM or uh, yeah. Yeah, the voucher? So I think uh, uh, our POC will be to look at government disbursements uh, with CPF uh, and uh, to prove the uh, fractionalization ability of the PBM in order to uh, facilitate multiple payments out to the individuals. They can still use the same form factors that have already been rolled out, for example, at our ATM machines with facial recognition and identity card, and that's how you would identify the individuals. Uh, they can also uh, pre-program uh, uh, the, the PBMs to be able to either assign it to a family member to come and collect, which today is actually a very manual process at the bank counters. Uh, they could also dictate uh, where that money could go to. Uh, so even though they are unbanked, the programming can occur upfront based on the requirements of the, of the individual. And if they wanted it to be sent to uh, a caregiver who needs to uh, make certain purchases on their behalf. All of those things can be programmed. The fact of the matter is, PBM can be used at it to not only store the value of the, the funds that is going, but also 
look at multiple form factors and channels of disbursement of these of these monies. And I think the work that uh, uh, open uh, uh, what Talita site is doing uh, in terms of the redeem vouchers also will help to um, uh, ease the burden of the unbanked and the non-digitally savvy. I think there was a question on that as well. To be able to receive uh, uh, the the outcome, the cash, or maybe the goods or services that they purchase uh, with the programmability of this uh, new currency of these digital currencies. Thank you, and and maybe turning over to Adrian then to speak about this, the the trial you're undertaking with uh, Skills Future. Okay, so maybe just just a little bit of uh, background. So Skills Future, we know, is a Singapore st statutory board, um, and and and, and they, they are the key player where the government actually gives training grants to Singaporeans. Um, they they, they administer it to make sure that 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 the Skills Future credits are, are properly used for eligible courses. So the key aim is to make sure that there's no misuse of funds. Secondly, that it is used in the proper manner, that it is meant to training the, the, the citizens so that, so that we can be a productive workforce. The, so some of these conditions, and is, is some of them include things like, is this an eligible course? Is it provided, is, is, is the training provider pre-approved by, 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 by SkillsFuture? Um, or, did the person, when they sign up for the course, did they actually participate in the course? Uh, because if not, then it's just a waste of money. The government shouldn't be paying for it. Or even the validity. Because there is an expiry to skills future credit. So upon a certain time, then the, the skills future credit should not be valid for use anymore. So all this potentially can be actually programmed in some form or fashion there's into, into PBMs for, for, for the use. So the key, the key goal actually is, is, is how can we more efficiently improve the control process to, 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 to make sure that the money is, 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 is used the way that it is intended to be used. The, so so the, the, the test is, 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 is going on, but, but today actually there are, SkillsFuture already has many parts of, of, of that control process in place already. So for us, that the first step is to then find use cases to, to improve it in, in, in small little gaps that, that today may not be covered in the current processes. The other area that, that, that we also then, then learn from this is that in, in brainstorming and working together with SkillsFuture in, 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 in seeing how we can program these conditions into digital SGD, it can potentially change the processes so it's no longer a BAU process of putting the, the usual controls in place because today the controls that are put in place require some party to do work. So for example, the training provider has to do some work to say that the, 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 the individuals has participated or certain verifications needs to be done. The most training providers in SkillsFuture's case, they will sign up for, for, to do this work to, to get the payment, but, but not everyone, particularly the overseas training providers. So what actually potentially this program, PBM can, 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 can do for, 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 for SkillsFuture's and, and because it is then more efficient uh, in, in programming the conditions into PBMs, they can potentially take this to other training providers, particularly the overseas training providers, so that they enlarge their ecosystem of training providers and courses that they can actually then provide for the citizens that they demand to train. So what I'm saying is that it's not just in a matter of, of improving controls, but underlyingly because of, of, of the, the, the difference in, in technology and in the medium and the effectiveness of, of, of doing so, they can find other benefits uh, in, in SkillsFuture's case to look for more service providers, more training providers to, to, to then be on board and therefore um, meet their, 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 their goals to, to train Singaporeans better. So I guess there's uh, uh, some questions about the infrastructure and whether there's, uh, I guess, uh, plans for us to build a government-backed uh, blockchain. So I think from, from our perspective uh, uh, for Project Orchid, I think the design 
is uh, done such a way that it's agnostic on the implementation. I think the, the goal there and the thinking behind that is interoperability and openness. Mm. Uh, presumably, the construct would still work on any in, uh, ledger infrastructure. But certainly, I guess, in the future, uh, future phases, and we've mentioned this as well, uh, is to look at, I guess, optimal uh, ledger for, let's say, a CBDC uh, a ledger itself. I'm um, going to ask maybe Penkim a few questions on the tech and the maybe cyber risk areas, if you can. Just chime in on, because I think there are some questions about kind of controls that, that uh, that's needed, I guess, in such a system. So if, uh, Pinky, if you could just share your perspective on the, on the tech, technical side. If somebody's issuing out a digital SGD, for example, you know, what, what are the maybe controls that people, or in fact, just programmable money in general, digital currency in general, what are some of the areas that they should be mindful of? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Can, right? Um, so, in, in when we were designing this, to get an OGP on uh, this uh, use case, uh, and we were looking at uh, building up the smart contracts, right? We have to be mindful that smart contracts is just like any program uh, that is in the internet. So therefore, there's uh, you know a lot of consideration of how do we you know make sure it's secure, and we also go to the extent that even for this pilot, we have actually run an external independent pen test to make sure that the smart contract. Uh, itself, right, uh, is is uh, secure, right? Is robust kind of thing. So uh, that's that's one, right? And we also think about say uh, future uh, future kind of consideration, which I think is some of the question come out is that how do you know that this the 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 you know money programmable money that is transferred to a, a individual or wallet uh, is going to the right party? So those are things, for example, that you know you have to tokenize. The credentials. It's called a verifiable credentials, which is some people call it NFT, right? Which can associate to the individual and bind to the wallet. So you can think of it that you know uh, for for you know validations, you know setup is it could be as good as you know using SingPass to verify the individual and the mobile and to bind that into the wallet to make it secure, right? Uh, uh, and that is this the right party with the verifiable credentials. So there are all these, uh, you know, uh, considerations of, you know, um, you know, um, or, uh, security on smart contracts, on variable credentials. No different from how, how you would actually build uh, internet banking, uh, internet fronting uh, applications. Yeah. Okay. And uh, maybe uh, back to one thing a bit. I think there are some questions about fungibility actually of PBMs. Is it really fungible? Can you use it with different wallets? Do you want to comment on that? Yeah. So that's a. Uh that's one of the aim of this trial, which is to uh, push the boundary as much as possible on the fungibility of uh, PBMs, in the sense that we want to enable, once we are able to set up the, the rails, we hope that we can encourage more participants and more contributors to, to build on top of the rails and enable transfers of PBMs or movement of PBMs to be made between different parties or different wallet uh, containers or different UX uh, uh, experiences. Uh, that's one of the main aim of this uh, trial. And, and uh, building it on, on uh, uh, a public blockchain allows us to do that. There are trade-offs. There are also very uh, important considerations to think about in terms of the, the settlement speed, the, the speed of uh, the cost of each transaction. These are things that we, we need to continue to, to work through. But uh, we, we aim to push the boundary on this front as much as possible in order to achieve a very, very quick scale and adoption. All right, so I, I think uh, there's some, I guess, questions about uh, the level of uh, uh, it being uh, controlled, restricted, bound, unbound. I think. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's really a choice. I don't think all the, although we, I think the panel is speaking about PBM uh, and, and wrapping, I guess, the digital SGD, I don't, I don't think by any means it always has to be bounded. I think there's a chance for it to be, uh, 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 you know, used on its own. Um, if I can maybe turn to, over to Melvin just to kind of uh, get his perspective as well, because I know he spoke about uh, helping the unbanked uh, or those without a bank account. Um, Melvin, maybe you speak to us on some of the other use cases. I think you, you and I were kind of speaking about, you were speaking something about conveyancing or some other use case. Yeah, so... Uh, beyond vouchers, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, uh, when we looked at the use cases uh, beyond uh, what we were trying to solve for in today's uh, world, uh, we want to look at use cases that bring together um, uh, many parties, interested parties in a singular transaction into one place in order to facilitate uh, uh, the settlement against conditions that are being set. So while we can, conditions can be restricted because perhaps the payer of the, the monies want to focus it on certain use, use of those funds, you can also imagine it to be more of a use case in the, in the area of, so for example, of conveyancing, uh, where basically you have many parties, interested parties in settling a transaction and you need a trusted infrastructure for all parties to come in, fulfill their re conditions and requirements before the monies are dispersed. And I think that's where uh, 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 purpose-bound money can go the next level. And I think in, in that particular case, um, these use cases, fairly complex use cases today, are being uh, manually uh, uh, managed. And all of this can be actually digitalized in a, in a way that will be useful for the participants to have a, a, a trust factor. Now, I talk about the trust factor and I do want to spend maybe 30 seconds on that. The, the underlying currency is digital cash in a sense. It's a digital currency. And it's as good as what the digital currency is. So when we talk about these use cases, we're talking about central bank backed digital cash. Regulated cash that people can trust and know that when they have it, it is theirs and theirs to own. The programmability allows us to be able to make it useful in terms of fulfilling the needs of that cash. And I think many questions around who can program, what can program, what ethical considerations are there, is really bound by the, the trust factor around this currency. So we hope that there will be more of these questions coming up uh, to be able to help us to really define as a, as a group here, as you can see, the banks, the central bank and our, our e-money uh, providers as well, to come up with something that really can be proven right, to be a trusted source of funds going forward. Yeah, so one thing that's perhaps uh, unique here that we are trying to do, uh, there's ability, I guess, to program into the currency itself you know, programmed money or programmable money. But we're introducing, I guess, a, maybe a third model in a sense of a purpose-bound money, which is to define the conditions and the purpose layer um, independent of the underlying uh, currency itself. So that's maybe a construct uh, that gives us some level of flexibility depending on the use case and what's the underlying currency. Those could be brought in together. Um, we're running out of time, but I wanted to also mention that we do have a white paper that speaks about the design considerations for some of these additional use cases uh, that was uncovered through the contributions of the panelists and in fact, more uh, that we unfortunately don't have the time to uh, uh, introduce on this panel. So with that, thank you very much for your patience, your uh, uh, participation to everyone and I'd like to thank the panelists as well. Thank you.